Welcome everyone. It is noon, so we will get started. Get started on our webinar on poison dangers lurking in our homes. My name is Mary Lizakowski, and I'm a Coalition Health Director with Foundation for Healthy North Dakota. We are a newer nonprofit organization established in 2022 with a mission to promote health and wellness across North Dakota by working at the community level. We are growing a statewide coalition that will enable local communities to collaborate and work together on common initiatives. By becoming a member of the coalition, you will be the first to receive educational opportunities like this one, updates on relevant public health information, legislative news, as well as access to digital advocacy resources and toolkits. Some quick housekeeping items is uh, webinar attendees are automatically muted for the presentation. If you do have questions, please put them in the chat box and we will be monitoring the questions as they come in. We are recording this presentation and we'll leave time in the end to address any questions that you may have. And after the presentation, a link to the recording will be sent out along with an evaluation survey. It is my pleasure to introduce our presenter today, Karma Hansen. She is the coordinator of Safe Kids Grand Forks, a position she has held for nearly 30 years, trained as a neonatal nurse and having spent her early career in that field and as the manager of the NICU and pediatric unit at All True Health System. Karma has taken her love of children and her passion for injury prevention into the Safe Kids Coordinator role. The coalition she leads covers Northeast North Dakota and Northwest Minnesota, and their focus is on keeping kids safe at home, at school, at play, and on the way. Karma has served on many state and national advisory boards, focusing on education and policy development. She is trained as a certified child passenger safety technician and has certification in special needs transportation and transportation of children in ambulances. Her passion for injury prevention and desire to form effective coalitions and partnerships have, has helped to make Safe Kids Grant Works a reputable and trusted source for childhood injury prevention in our state and in the region. Welcome, and I will turn it over to you, Karma. Thank you so very much, Mary. I appreciate the opportunity to be here today. I'm going to um, share my screen here. And as we go along, as uh, Mary said, if you have questions or you want any of the resources that you see uh, in the presentation, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my contact information will be at the end, uh, but you can also put it in the chat just while it's fresh on your mind. And if you see something, um, I'd also encourage you to go to our website, which is safekidsgf.com. And a lot of the materials uh, that we talk about today are going to be on that website. And if you want hard copies of it or an electronic copy that you could share with clients or colleagues or family or friends, uh, please, uh, again, just put that in the chat and we'll be happy to send that out. I'm going to get my screen share going on right now. Are we looking okay, Mary? Is seeing that fine? Looks great. Okay, perfect. So as Mary said, we're going to talk today about poisoning dangers in our homes. Uh, it is National Poison Prevention Week, and so this seems like a very appropriate time to be sharing um, information around this topic. Uh, there isn't any one particular topic we're going to talk about. We're going to kind of cover a wide range today, and we've got a lot of ground to cover. So with that, I want to thank the Foundation for Healthy North Dakota uh, for inviting me here today to present on a topic that, as a nurse, um, is pretty important to me. Uh, as Mary said, um, our mission with Safe Kids is to keep uh, kids safe from what we refer to as preventable injuries. Public oftentimes refers to them as accidents. Uh, we refer them to them as preventable injuries because we know that uh, there are things that we can do that will keep um, kids safe, whether it be uh, out on the water or on a playground or from medications or things like that. And so we know that they're very preventable and uh, we focus, as Mary said, at home, at school, at play and on the way. These are some of the risk areas that we cover. Uh, we will hit on poison dangers today, which falls kind of under our home uh, safety category. But that being said, uh, if you do work in any of these areas, uh, this um, is some of the resources that we have available on our website. 
Uh, I am a part of Safe Kids Grand Forks. I'm the coordinator for that coalition. Uh, but you will see there are other coalitions in our state and into Minnesota as well. We are a part of a global network. Uh, the Safe Kids Worldwide was started about 35 years ago. And you can see on the map in the upper top left, the coalitions around the United States. But we are a global network covering around about 30 countries around the world. And you can see those shown on the map in the bottom right hand corner. All True Health System is the lead agency for Safe Kids Grand Forks, uh, which means that basically this is where our office is at. But we are intended to be a community coalition that brings together partners who really all have that same focus and mission of preventing injuries to kids. So if you or your agency uh, is interested in partnering with Safe Kids Grand Forks or any of the other coalitions in North Dakota, uh, please reach out to me and we'll get you connected uh, either with our Coalition or any of the other ones uh, that are in the state. Uh, you will see uh, listed here that we have full coalition meetings once a month, uh, the second Thursday of the month, but we also have subcommittees uh, that focus in the five areas that you see um, listed on the screen. So maybe you're interested in being involved in everything related to our coalition, or maybe you just have a focus in one of those five that you see there. Either way, reach out to us. We'd love to get you involved. As I mentioned, this week is National Poison Prevention Week, and we are doing a lot during this week to raise awareness about the dangers of poisons that might be in the home. Uh, we're going to talk about some of those today, uh, and uh, please check out our website and our Facebook page also uh, for more uh, of the other topics that we're not going to be able to get to in this presentation. These are the areas that we're going to cover today, electronic cigarettes, laundry and detergent pods, water beads, carbon monoxide, and then medication poisoning. Electronic cigarettes, what are these? Um, they are devices that are becoming more and more popular uh, rather than uh, having the traditional cigarette that we um, have seen for many, 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 many years um, as a part of our culture uh, and use. Uh, these are devices that are not just looking like a cigarette like you see here, but they are um, morphing themselves into devices, to be honest with you, that are more easily hideable, if you will. Uh, uh, a lot of the teens and youth are using them and it looks like a little toy figure or it looks like a, a Sharpie marker or a highlighter or a jump drive for a computer. I'm going to show you some of those um, images of what those devices look like. But to suffice to say that uh, this market is really being targeted at our teens and our youth with the idea of getting them addicted to nicotine uh, so that the product continues to sell. Uh, what is so dangerous about electronic cigarettes um, is if you were to take a traditional pack of cigarettes, it would take maybe two or three packs of that uh, to be inhaled uh, for a child to become nicotine toxic. Um, these devices are sold where they have cartridges um, or a container where the liquid nicotine goes into. And that liquid nicotine, as it is dispensed, there is enough poison or enough nicotine in those dispensers uh, in one teaspoon that could kill a young child. I'm going to repeat that one teaspoon. And what's really dangerous with this is that uh, there are several ways in which you can get this uh, substance into your body. With a cigarette, you smoke it. With these, um, you can inhale it like you would a traditional cigarette. You can swallow it so a young child might get a hold of something that looks like one of these containers on the screen and swallow it. Uh, or you can simply get it on your skin. So let's say the mom or an older sibling or a grandparent has this device out on the counter. They're charging their rechargeable devices and the kid sees the, uh, 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 the container that it's dispensed in uh, and they open it up and they smell it. Uh, these are oftentimes come out in flavors such as fruit flavors or mint or candy. Uh, they, they're very appealing child spills it, they get it on their hands, all of a sudden uh, that is absorbing through their skin. Uh, we had a principal at a school here in North Dakota that had confiscated some of these substances from some teenagers uh, 
took them to the office, set the devices on his desk later in the day, was feeling headache, lightheaded, uh, heart palpitations. And what they identified is that uh, the substance had been on the products that he took away and it had, had absorbed through the skin and was causing these nicotine type substances. So they're very, very dangerous in that they can easily get into the body uh, as a poisoning agent uh, and have some unintended um, consequences. If you look at these devices, uh, the bottom right uh, or left image right here shows uh, what an uh, inhalable device looks like. They come oftentimes in a storage pouch like this. It might look like a pencil case. Uh, and they come with a recharging device. Uh, these are oftentimes hooked to a computer or to a USB port that you might have in your outlet uh, or on your uh, other devices uh, that need a recharge uh, device with them. And so they're out in a surface or in a place where people, um, and especially curious little kids, can get into. Uh, the Soren product is a new one. Uh, it's a device that if a teen or somebody threw that into their backpack, uh, might look very innocuous, something that maybe you don't even think uh, uh, what it is. You don't realize that it's a smoking device. Uh, they'll come like this, looks like maybe a, an office product or a cosmetic product. This one here, a lot of parents have said, oh my gosh, I thought my kid was carrying around um, a, 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 a lip gloss in their, um, in their backpack. Uh, here they are sold as a wristwatch type device. Uh, and this one here, if you look at this, might look like a thumb drive, a jump drive that you might use in your computer. Uh, they're bright, they're colorful, and uh, while well, we passed legislation in the state of North Dakota several years ago that requires that uh, the devices, when they're sold, or the liquid nicotine when it's sold, has to come with a child-proof cap on it, uh, we know that once they get into the home, if the parent or caregiver or who's ever using it chooses to switch that cover out, uh, they may not have a top on them that uh, will prevent a young child from getting into them. Um, if you look at this, you will see that they come in a variety of colors. Pineapple punch, how it, that, that sounds kind of good, right? Vanilla bean, uh, mandarin, skittleberries, razzleberry, blueberry, lots of fun sounding uh, flavors uh, that are available on the market. Uh, if you look at this e-cigarette, um, you'll see right here uh, in some of the product information, each e-cigarette is about three packs of cigarettes. That little tiny device that's no bigger than a pencil or a pen will fit into your pocket, and yet it contains as much nicotine as three packs of cigarettes. Think of how dangerous that could be for young kids. This um, slide, which we I will share all these slides uh, with Mary and she can pass them out to you. So I'm not going to um, read every one word for word, but I wanted you to have the information as you took a look at uh, some of the data that shows um, the danger or what we're seeing for number of incidents. Uh, this one speaks to the rise in incidents. When these products came out in 2011, uh, we started to see a huge increase in the number of calls to our poison control centers. And um, you'll see between April 2022 and March of 2023, there were about 7,043 reports uh, due to uh, kids that were unintentionally poisoned by these e-cigarette devices. And most of those are occurring in children under five years of age. As you can imagine, they're curious, they explore. Uh, kids of that age developmentally, uh, they put things in their mouth. Uh, that's how they learn about their environment. So very, very dangerous for kids of that age group. So these are some of the signs and symptoms of nicotine poisoning. I won't read them all, but uh, if you have a child or even an adult that is experiencing any of these, um, you really should get them to the ER because as you can see, convulsions, difficulty breathing, uh, some of these are things that have some pretty serious consequences. And if they're experiencing those symptoms, you don't know how long that product is going to stay in their system. And if those symptoms will just uh, continue to be exacerbated with an uh, increased absorption of the nicotine product, and it could lead to uh, some pretty serious consequences as you see apnea or cessation of breathing, rapid breathing, things that would be very, very, very dangerous. So don't uh, hesitate to get 
get somebody who might be suffering from uh, any of these uh, symptoms of nicotine poisoning to an emergency room as soon as possible. The next topic, we're going to talk about water beads. What are they? Uh, looking at my slide, uh, they look like kind of fun little things. What the heck are these? Uh, they're not marbles uh, in that child's hand right there. Uh, but these are products that are being sold uh, to uh, the public. Uh, they are oftentimes sold as something that is used in floral arranging. You'll see here the vase instead of water. You put them in, it makes them easy to arrange how the flowers stand up in the vases or uh, they're also used as sensory toys. Uh, they might be sold prepackaged in a pouch like this. People might buy a pack such as this one down in the lower corner and, and put them in Ziploc bags and make their own. Here you see they're coming in an array of um, uh, of, of toys, little animals that appear fun uh, for the kids to play with. These have become very, very, very popular. What are the dangers of them? Uh, first of all, when these products are sold, uh, they come out in this container. I think there are 20,000 of these water beads in this container. If you were to add water to that, it would expand enough to fill a small uh, child's uh, swimming pool. Uh, so they, they grow huge as they um, get exposed to water. Uh, so as we know, uh, as things grow in size, you'll see that the first danger of these water beads is that they can cause obstruction. That can be in the GI tract if they get into the stomach. It could be in the ear canal if a child gets it there or is it in their nasal cavity. Um, if a child were to inhale these and get into the lungs, they'll be exposed to bodily fluids that will then cause this very, very small um, pinpoint sized uh, piece of uh, of of device, uh, it'll start to grow and grow and grow, causing obstruction. If you look at this one, here's a young child who has swallowed an exorbitant amount of them that has now um, expanded into the stomach and caused uh, a, a potential uh, life-threatening situation of an obstruction um, or a lot of GI complications. Obstruction is one of the dangers of them, but we also know that there are uh, issues in some of these products that are coming in, most of them from China, uh, that uh, have toxicity. There are known carcinogens or cancer-causing agents in these products. You will see two of them right here uh, that were sold on the U.S. market when it was determined that these products were uh, cancerous uh, and had um, danger to the public, they were, uh, the, the U.S. reached out and said, will you issue a recall on these products? To which the company said, nope, we're not going to do it. These have been taken off of places like Amazon and uh, things like that that are selling or used to sell them, but that does not capture all of the sources at which people can purchase these items online. So this uh, Jenga store and the Tula Duo, uh, these are the products. I pulled that from their website of what those um, items look like that are the ones that uh, have the recent recall has been issued because of the carcinogen um, that, is, that is found in them. This uh, Consumer Product Safety Commission shows that um, every year about 7,000 uh, water bead ingestions lead to kids being treated in the ER. Uh, we also know of kids who have died from these products. So uh, there are a lot, a lot of places that even uh, beyond the carcinogen um, issue are pulling these products because uh, they know that people are now using them for these sensory toys or these play toys uh, for kids. And uh, they know that there are those um, dangers associated with the obstruction. But they're readily available on the market. Just go on to Amazon and you can find, find a lot of sources where you can get them. Um, here's an example. This little red dot is the size that this water bead started out as uh, when it came from the manufacturer. And you will see after being exposed to water for a period of about four hours, this is about the size uh, that it increased to. That's a rather large uh, piece of uh, a, a substance that if you get, get that into the gut, you imagine uh, these look a, a lot like the little nerds that are sold. Uh, and imagine a kid taking a whole handful of those, uh, getting it in their GI system. And the next thing you know, uh, you're staring uh, at an x-ray uh, that, like, look, that looked like this one right here. Um, major complications that can occur from that. So you'll see, uh, you here's how they start out. 
uh, after about four hours, they've reached their max capacity or their max size. Uh, well, this one is a, a, about this big around, the size of maybe a pea um, uh, or a grape. Uh, there are some that can get to be the size of a baseball uh, and, and, and so very, very dangerous. Um, so what are some signs and symptoms of swallowing water beads? Uh, maybe the kid is refusing to eat. Uh, they're feeling like they have something that's stuck in their throat or their chest. They're lethargic. Uh, maybe they have constipation, uh, drooling, vomiting, wheezing, abdominal pain. Uh, if you suspect any of those, uh, we would encourage you to get the child to the ER, uh, have them have a, a, an abdominal and chest x-ray taken uh, to ascertain if there is something uh, there that could be uh, leading to that type of um, complications that, that, that can occur from these. I told you that there have been a lot of, lot of recalls issued lately for these products, and I anticipate that more and more of them will come as we see more and more children that are impacted by these. Uh, if you have older kids in your house, the danger is, is that if they're playing with these products and they drop one of the simple little tiniest of beads onto the floor that's not expanded yet, uh, think about where your 9, 10, 11, 12 month old kids are at. Their eye level is down at the floor. They explore their environment by putting things in their mouth. Their visual acuity is in a spot where we may not even catch it as we're sweeping up or vacuuming up around the area in which those products were played with. Uh, and as we talked about, little kids explore by putting things in their mouth. Um, I've got an eight-month-old grandson right now, and I tell you, everything you give to him, it goes to the mouth because that's how they learn about their environment. So here's just a few of the recalls um, that you will see that have been issued recently around these products. So what are some safety tips? Um, consider waiting until all children in your household are at least three years old. That is, if you even need to use them at all, I'd encourage you to not have them in the house. But if you are, uh, get them away and consider waiting until you don't have kids in that young age group where everything goes into their mouth. Um, use the water beads on a table over a hard floor so that when you are done, you can immediately sweep that area afterwards uh, because, again, it's very hard to see because of the, the small size of them. Um, store the water beads in a tightly sealed container and then supervise kids when they are using it. That is, if you insist on using them at all. Let's talk about laundry detergents and laundry pods. Uh, these are uh, devices that have come on the market uh, because uh, people have demanded more convenience. Um, they are a lot cleaner in that, you know, you don't pour out the liquid and it gets all goopy and then you screw the cover on and you got that uh, kind of substance running down the, the cover of your jar. Uh, we can put what used to take up a full big cup of detergent into a smaller packed device. So from an environmental standpoint, you get a lot more uh, washes out of your same size uh, container than you do with the big hard plastic jugs that are getting thrown away into our landfills or maybe they get recycled. Uh, but they're not as heavy in weight. Uh, a lot of reasons that the consumers have asked and demanded uh, products of this type. The problem comes in that uh, these are oftentimes stored in locations that are uh, accessible to kids. Think about where you keep your uh, dishwasher soap. How many of you have it underneath your kitchen sink? You don't need to, uh, Mary's admitting to it, right? Uh, it, it's convenient. It's easy. It's kind of like that's what that cupboard is made for, right? Uh, a lot of us now have front load washing machines in our uh, laundry room. And many of us maybe have put a, a drawer underneath it to lift it up a little bit higher to put it at an easier to operate level. And that drawer at the bottom is a handy place to store your laundry pods because it makes it quick and easy to reach them and throw them into that washer. But think about young kids that get into this and how appealing that color is. And I go back to what I said at the very beginning, and I've said it many times, little kids learn about their environment by putting things into their mouth. And so pop that thing goes to the mouth or they chew on it. And as they do that, what we were seeing happen is that that clear plastic film that was containing the product was bursting. Now think about a child that puts a balloon in their mouth and when that balloon bursts, what is their uh, initial reaction? They go, 
and they gasp. And where we see dangers with balloons is that those that piece of latex is aspirated oftentimes down into the lungs. And the same thing happens with this. If a kid is choking or uh, 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 chewing on it and it bursts open, that bitter taste of that detergent, their reaction is to <sighs> like that. And that detergent is oftentimes inhaled into the GI system or down into the lungs. And what we see is kids who develop a chemical type pneumonia uh, in their lungs from um, inhaling that um, into that area. We have seen kids who have had to be put on ventilators uh, for several days until the little alveoli, the air sacs and the lungs can heal from that chemical type pneumonia. And so uh, think about um, these products and how we need to store them um, safely, just as we do with any of the other um, types of products that I'm talking about um, related to uh, poisoning um, dangers in our homes. Um, again, every day in the United States, we see about 65 ER visits that occur uh, because of kids getting into some of these products, soaps, detergents, bleaches, disinfectants. This is some national data that talks about uh, laundry packets. Uh, we have seen an increase in the number of these because these have become more and more popular. Uh, they are sold uh, in large, large quantities, both for uh, washing machines and also for dish dishwashers. Um, so again, become very, very popular um, for consumers to purchase. Uh, we talked a little bit about this with uh, the beads, the water beads. Um, Kids that are under age five, those young kids are the ones that are most at risk for cleaning type product dangers. Number one, they can't discern things that are food products from cleaning products. They're drawn to bright colors. They learn about their environment by putting things in their mouth and their vantage point or their perspective on things is down in a spot that's very different than it would be for an adult. If you take a look at this image, uh, this shows you kind of what they're looking at from a kid's world. I've got stars on the images that are uh, detergent packets and detergent pods, but put that alongside some things, a, a little gummy shark and some candy and some lifesavers and some suckers. Uh, those are all things that kids put in their mouth and parents may give to them to eat. And for a young child, their minds cannot discern the difference between that. They see bright, they see colorful, they see um, snack size, and in it goes uh, into the mouth. And so we need to be very, very careful where we're storing those products. Here are some of the things that uh, these cleaning uh, products and laundry pods will take kids to a hospital for. Uh, difficulty breathing, excessive vomiting, um, eye irritations or burns. Uh, temporary loss of vision and even loss of consciousness from a high consumption of a large um, amount of this type of product. Now, here are some of the issues. Um, we have a lot of people who do laundry in a community laundry room where they may take a load of laundry down, put their detergent in the basket, carry it to that space, bring it back, set it in a place where they're going to go for their next load of laundry. That detergent may stay down low and in laundry baskets. Uh, we may have people who have a laundry room, but they decide that they're going to follow some of what they see on HGTV and make their laundry room into this beautiful um uh, you know, showroom type place where they don't want this bright, ugly orange uh, detergent bottle sitting out. So they put it into canters like this. Look at that scent boosters, detergent clothespins. It might look really nice in your laundry room to decant these items. But what it does is it takes it out of what has been designed as a child proof or a child uh, resistant, I should say, packaging. Um, and it puts it into something that's very easy to get to. It's very visible uh, and it makes it really, really easy uh, for kids to get into. So what we say with these products is to use uh, store, not decor. Store them in their original container. Don't use these as uh, decor, uh, decorative items in a laundry room. I want you to take a look at these two bottles. Uh, much like this image here uh, with the detergent pods, Here's an example of a cleaning product. This is called Fabulosa. It's bright, it's colorful, it's got a rainbow and flowers. 
I've opened this product and it smells very, very good. It's fresh and clean and almost kind of a grapey floral smell. Um, so it doesn't deter you. You, you, you know, an ammonia you might pull back because of the strong smell. This one actually smells pretty darn good. And yet look at that compared to a Gatorade that a child might see. Think of Windex that's blue and Powerades. Uh, so think of how confusing that this is uh, to young children um, and, and the way that we uh, market products. So again, with these uh, products, it's important to store them, keep them in their original packaging. Uh, the, the manufacturers of these products have done a whole bunch of work to try to make these products safer. Uh, one of, example is they've made a, a top that is wide and it's got little tabs on both sides. In order to open that, you have to push the tabs on both sides. And uh, they're fine to do for an adult hand, but for little kids' hands, their hands aren't big enough to push both the tabs at the same time. So by keeping it in that original container, uh, it helps to... Uh, keep little kids from being able to access it. Some of the other things that the industry has done to try to make this product a little bit safer, uh, besides making the storage containers such that um, you have the tabs, they also have bags like this where you have to push the little tab down and slide it. They have also made the film on the plastic coating that contains that detergent bitter tasting. So hopefully kids will take it out of their mouth. Uh, they've um, required that there be a delay in how quickly that film can um, dissolve when in water so that it takes a little bit longer. So it's not just a couple licks by a child and it starts to dissolve. It takes a lot longer exposure. And the other thing they've done is they have put an industry standard on uh, requirement that says you can't just squeeze it with a small hand so that it would burst open. Um, it takes much more uh, force to do that than a little hand should be able to do. So we have seen with some of these changes uh, that the industry has put into place that the use of packets is going up, but the um, number of incidents is going down. So if we can keep those products in their original container, it stands to see um, that we continue to see a decrease in the number of these incidents. So keep the uh, products in their original container, keep products out of sight and out of reach of kids, and then you're going to hear me say this a couple times today about storing uh, or putting the uh, poison control center number into your phone. We'll talk more about that in just a minute. Carbon monoxide, uh, we're going to transition to that, talking about that as a poisonous agent. And what is so dangerous about carbon monoxide is that it is colorless and it's odorless. Uh, if you have a fire in your home, you can smell it. Uh, it bothers your eyes. You can see the smoke. This is a substance that I could be sitting in a room right now with a, a very high level of carbon monoxide, and I would have no way to tell by looking around my environment to say, oh, I think there's a, a carbon monoxide issue going on. If it was a fire, I'd say, oh my gosh, there's a fire going on somewhere because of the smell and the, the visual sight of that smoke. Uh, carbon monoxide is not the same can't see it, you can't smell it, you can't taste it. And so that's what makes this product um, so, so, so very dangerous. There's only two ways really you're going to know that there's carbon monoxide. One is by knowing what the signs and symptoms are and putting two and two together to say, oh my gosh, I have a headache, I'm nauseous, I don't feel well, I'm weak, and say, I wonder if there could be carbon monoxide going on, which most people don't do. Most people think, gosh, I must be coming down with something. I, I need to lay down and take a nap or something like that. Or the second way you know that there's high levels is by having uh, functioning alarms uh, in that space. So you're going to hear me talk about the importance of those alarms in just a minute. A carbon monoxide is found from the fumes that are produced anytime you burn fuel. So it could be from a car, a stove, a gas grill, a fireplace, a gas ranges, furnaces, generators, water heaters, or clothes dryers. Uh, each year, about 184 kids die from carbon monoxide poisoning, and about 20,000 kids visit the ER. Uh, when we look at North Dakota and Minnesota, uh, states that are 
uh, we're in and near, uh, we rank amongst some of the highest per capita in the nation um, of carbon monoxide um, incidents that occur. So we need to be really astute and help our clients uh, to get information um, about the danger of this uh, particular gas. When you look at the primary sources of carbon monoxide poisoning, you can see the generators are way up there. Uh, we have seen over uh, the last couple of years where uh, generators have been the cause of deaths in our state and in Minnesota, where generators are placed maybe by a fish house or in a man cave or by a, a trailer house where they don't have electricity. So they're using a generator uh, to power uh, their, their uh, equipment. Uh, that generator is placed too close to that home. Uh, the uh, gases from it get trapped underneath it and they're sucked up um, into that environment. Um, generators are very, very dangerous because of that carbon monoxide they give off. And many times people do not place them far enough away. They need to be at least 30 feet away from a building. So uh, a fish house, a hunting shack, a man cave, a home, whatever it is, uh, a tent, whatever, uh, that that the, the carbon monoxide that's given off by those generators um, overpowers that environment in which they're in. I said a minute ago that oftentimes carbon monoxide poisonings, uh, the signs and symptoms uh, occur and people think, gosh, I just don't feel well. I must be coming down with the flu. You can see dizziness, weakness, headache, nausea, fatigue, vomiting, chest discomfort are all symptoms of both carbon monoxide poisoning and the flu. And I think if I were to ask the people that are on this call, uh, how many of you, if you had those symptoms, would say, oh, I must have carbon monoxide poisoning? Probably not. You'd say, gosh, you know, I just have a headache. I don't feel all that great. I must be coming down with something. I'm going to go to bed early tonight and try to see if I can feel a little bit better uh, in the morning. And Oftentimes what happens is that morning comes, those people in that household don't show up for school or work. A call is made to the local law enforcement to say, can you go do a welfare check? And oftentimes we'll see a whole family that has been wiped out uh, because of carbon monoxide poisoning. So really, really, really critical that we um, get uh, alarms in those homes so that people can be alerted to it. Who's most at risk? Uh, obviously, um, infants because of their small size, but elderly people uh, who maybe don't think of those symptoms as carbon monoxide poisoning. It's just they think just signs of getting older. People with chronic heart disease, anemia, or anybody um, with breathing problems. It is important to have alarms, uh, detectors in all of your um, floors of your home. Smoke alarms need to be placed in the ceiling because smoke uh, rises. Carbon monoxide um, is equally distributed. So you can put it down low to the ground in an outlet. You can have it up high. Um, it's easily, uh, evenly dispersed, uh, but it is important to have one on every floor of the home and especially near your uh, sleeping areas. And then to test those alarms, um, every five to seven years, they need to be replaced and you need to test them um, at least once or twice a year. We say when you change your clocks, change your batteries uh, to make sure that your batteries are in good use and to get in the routine of testing your carbon monoxide and smoke alarms um, every year or uh, every month. Uh, we do have a tracking document on our website where you can uh, put in uh, the, that you checked uh, those um those monitors um, each and every month just as a way to remember whether you've done it. Uh, so preventative maintenance of your equipment is important. Have your heating system checked and cleaned and serviced every year. Make sure that your glass appliances are vented properly. Um, never use a gas range or heating or an oven for heating your home if the power goes out. Um, never use a generator inside your home, basement, garage, or less than 20 feet away from a window, a door, or a vent. Have those detectors in your home and then also make sure that you are not running a car, say, to warm it up in a, an attached garage uh, because uh, even if the garage door is open, the winds can oftentimes push uh, that uh, fire or that uh, carbon monoxide into, um, into the home environment. What do you do if the sound alarm sounds goes off? Right away, get outside, get into fresh air. 
call your fire departments. Uh, they carry a handheld monitor and they will come in and ascertain uh, what the actual level is and determine uh, the source of that uh, and then help you to evacuate that carbon monoxide uh, from the environment. All right, we're going to talk and end with medication poisonings, which um, interestingly enough, uh, medications are actually the leading cause of poisoning in kids. Um, I remember back in, when my kids were little, we used to have Mr. Yuck stickers. We'd encourage people to put it on products. And we focused on things that were underneath our kitchen or bathroom counters, when in fact, uh, medications are now the leading cause of poisoning. Um, I am a nurse by background, and I have uh, dispensed and discharged many, many, many prescriptions or encourage patients to get an over-the-counter medication. And while they're used for things like heart disease and blood pressure and pain and allergies and vitamins to keep them well, and they do do good things for our bodies, we, uh, I think as healthcare, need to help the public start reframing medications, not just as something that is helpful for our bodies, but something that is a poisoning agent. And I say that because if you think of something as a poisonous product, I think we do more due diligence to store it safely or to put it up and out of sight and reach of kids. So let's dive into medications. What are they? I don't want you to think of just pills, liquids, creams, ointments, patches, inhalers, uh, injectables. It could be a variety of things. So when I talk about medicine, Open your mind to all of those things when we're talking about medications. Medication safety, why is it important? Every 10 minutes, a child goes to the ER somewhere in the United States because they got into a medication. So in the amount of time it's going to take me to do this presentation, six kids will have gone to the ER because they got into something that they weren't supposed to. Every hour, a child in the United States is hospitalized because they got into a medication. And this is what's really sad. And this number has actually been updated in a report that was just released this week. Um, the old report said that every 12 days, a child dies because they got into a medication. The very thing that I as a nurse am sending home with my patients is causing children in our country to die. That should be alarming to all of us. This is a new report that just got released this week that is gonna update those numbers on the page before that I just showed you, we have seen an increase in the number of incidents of deaths of kids uh, from uh, medications uh, in the last two years. The number is on the rise. Uh, what are the, the, the big culprits? Acetaminophen, ibuprofen, and narcotics. I want you to look at these numbers of the number of kids that are being treated in emergency rooms uh, from these type of products. In one year, they've got up from 4,700 um, ED cases of acetaminophen to 5,700. Ibuprofen from 2,000 to 3,600. That's almost doubled in, in a year's time. And narcotics has over doubled in a one year period of time. This is to say that these medications are being out and left in areas where kids are being able to get into them. So who's most at risk? I've talked about it before with the other products, young kids, those kids that are age one to four who don't have the life experiences to know it's dangerous, who are drawn to um, colorful things, who put things in their mouth. And then teenagers um, are because of the fact that uh, these are the kids or the youth that are starting to self-medicate. They're taking things for um, athletic injuries or maybe menstrual cramps or things like that, headaches. Uh, but yet they're not taught how to read a bottle. They may not understand that a, a drug can have two different names, but be the same active ingredient in it. Or uh, they may not realize that the, the pill that mom gave them two of yesterday to take for their menstrual cramps, that's two every four hours, their friend gives them one today that's taking something for menstrual cramps, and it's one every eight to 12 hours. And now they take two of them every four um, and don't realize that they have um, overdosed on that type of product. Uh, this infographic uh, speaks to uh, the, really the number of medications that and uh, that we have in our homes and in our environment and how they are increasing uh, by large numbers. In 1980, there was 
1.4 billion prescriptions that were filled in the United States. By 2014, that number had been um, increased to 4 billion. That's a huge increase that we're seeing in prescription drugs that are being dispensed. Every second of every day, we have about 125 prescriptions that are being filled in the United States. That's a lot of drugs that are going out. Over-the-counter medications in 1980, $5.5 billion in over-the-counter sales. By 2014, that number had gone up to $30.8 billion. That is $84 million every single day of over-the-counter medications that are being uh, sold. That is a large number of medications that are in our homes, in our purses, in our backpacks, in our travel bags. We need to be really vigilant about uh, where we store those because it's giving um, kids a lot of things to get access to. Where are kids finding medications? Uh, I, as a nurse, have recommended pill boxes to my elderly patients where maybe they don't have the hand strength to get the bottles open, or maybe they're on a lot of medications and they can't remember if they took it in the morning or um, it, 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 you know, they want to make sure that they dose it right. We have home health aides that go in and they'll set up pill boxes like this uh, for clients. Uh, but that being said, those don't have the child resistant tops on them. They're flipper doors, easy to open. Many times our clients will store them um, on a table or on a bedside uh, stand, on their bathroom counter, on their kitchen table, um, out where they're readily accessible. Um, on the ground, in purses, on the counter, uh, and in re um, reachable cabinets or the refrigerator were also locations where they got into them. Whose meds are they getting into? 48% of the time it's grandparents, which seems to reason, uh, given that um, the older you get, the more likely that you are to be on medications. But we also know that more and more kids are being cared for by grandparents, either as a primary caregiver or a secondary caregiver. What are kids getting into? Um, our studies show that it's um, these things here, pain meds, vitamins, allergy meds, diaper rash. Think of where you keep a diaper cream, right? In a diaper bag, maybe that you carry around, right? You set that on the floor and the little young one gets into it to get their toy, but finds a tube of diaper uh, cream instead. Eye drops, laxatives, and uh, vapor rubs. So what do we do to keep things safe? The first thing is store it safely. And what does that mean? Um, out of reach and out of sight for kids. Now, I'm telling you, I just said a little while ago, I have a, an eight and a half month old grandson. And right now he's crawling. So I know that I need to keep him safe from things where he can crawl to. That might be the diaper bag or a purse. But I also need to be thinking about what's next. He's going to be next pulling himself up on things or climbing up on things or walking. So out of sight and out of reach, you need to be one step ahead of where the kids are developmentally. And so be thinking about cabinet locks or the counter where I used to be able to store a bottle of Tylenol is no longer going to be good. You can see this curious little one right here is going to get creative and use those uh, shelves uh, as a source and a ladder to climb up onto shelving. So uh, again, we got to be thinking one step ahead of uh, where the kids are at. We need to think about bathrooms, kitchens. Uh, travel bags, uh, purses, uh, your babysitter that comes over and might have a backpack. Uh, we should think about locking them up, either with cabinet locks or med boxes. These are two items we have available in our Safe Kids office um, if anybody is interested or wants to connect with me about how to get those. Uh, why is this important? Um, we know that um, from research that over half of the kids that got into poisons uh, climbed to get onto something. It could have been moving that little dump truck over and standing on it, moving a high chair or a stool or something uh, that they uh, moved to get to it. And we know that a lot of these kids are getting into it um, even though it's in child resistant packaging. I will say child resistant is not child proof. Child resistant standards only require that it slows kids down. It does not mean that there is no way in, you know, tarnation that they're going to get into it. It just means that it's going to slow them down. So child resistant packaging should not give you a false sense of security. So now I've told you to store them out of sight, not of reach. People will say, well, if I don't do that, I'm going to forget. Um, think about putting a reminder in your phone. I tell my mom, 
put your little med dispenser on top of your plate in your cupboard rather than sitting it on the cupboard. Put it up by your salt and pepper and butter. There is no good Norwegian that is going to eat a meal without their salt and pepper and butter. Put it next to that. Write it on the calendar. Put a sticky note on the bathroom mirror. But don't have those things out and visible. We know that a lot of uh, medication poisonings occur because they're not given safely. Um, if you have uh, kids, uh, teens that are uh, dosing themselves, teach them how to read the labels. Um, if you give somebody a medication uh, it, the, and it comes with a cup, maybe the cup uh, is bigger than what the dose needs to be. Just because it was given a cup this big doesn't mean fill it up. It might only go so far on the cup. Take a Sharpie marker, mark where that is. Identify uh, so that they don't uh, fill it up in a way that is unsafe. Uh, make sure you always use the dosing device that came with the product. Don't use a kitchen uh, teaspoon just because it says give one teaspoon. Uh, spoon sizes are very different. And so you want to use the dosing device that came with that equipment or with that medication. Uh, keep a schedule. Um, oftentimes we have people that are handing off kids. They might share custody. They might, mom might work in the evening, dad at, 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 in the morning, and they might be kind of doing the handoff between jobs. Uh, they might take their kids to daycare. Daycare normally gives them meds, but now they take them a little bit later in the day, but they forget to communicate that they were given. Keep a schedule and a, a tracking uh, sheet with uh, that medication so that you can communicate uh, whether it has been given or not. These are some of the things that should be on that dosing sheet. Um, you can get a pad of these from me at our office free of charge if you want, or you can go online and you can uh, easily pull something like this off the internet or just take a scratch piece of paper and write it down. Put a check mark that that was given on a routine basis. All right. I want you to look at these and tell me which one is the medication and which one uh, is the. You can type it in the chat too. I'm going to go with the left is the medication. And that's correct. The left is, is the medication. Yep. But um, as a grown adult, you know that and you've probably seen vitamins, but I want you to think about a young child and think of how similar these look they taste the consistency is the same and these are vitamins and while one or two a day is fine and a kid may take one every day think of how confusing that is when mom now gives them a pack of fruit snacks and they get to eat 30 of them uh it, vitamins one or two a day is fine but they can be toxic to the liver if they're taken in large quantities so think about where those items are stored and kept in the house and the message that something like this gives to young kids here's another example these manufacturers have made medication to look exactly like candy let's make it into a sucker which is in and of itself a a, a candy right and now we've got cold medicines. Uh, this one is grape, and they've not only made it look like a sucker, they've made it look like a teddy bear. How fun does that look, right? Uh, this product down in the bottom right um, is x -Lax, and this is a, a Hershey's bar. And while this kid isn't going to die from taking all that x -Lax, I can tell you their mom and dad are not going to have a very fun night, and that kid's going to have quite the bellyache from that. So um, it's very, in my mind, concerning when uh, people uh, make uh, medicine to look like a product that is a candy. So we always say to kids, don't eat or drink anything that wasn't given to you by an adult. But how many of you have kids that every single one of them listens to every single rule that you ever make? Doesn't happen. So it's incumbent upon us as adults to safely store that medication. Now, if you happen to have questions about your child's medication, or if they got into something, you can always call their doctor, the pharmacist, or the poison helpline. I will tell you that this number right here is available 24 hours a day, seven days a week, uh, free of charge. Uh, our Poison Help Center for the state of North Dakota is actually administered out of Hennepin County Medical Center in the Twin Cities. Uh, they answer our calls, and it's a same number, this 1-800-222-1222 number, no matter where you're at in the United States. So I would encourage you to program that number into your phone. Um, you can also go to the Poison Control website and do a, like a live chat uh, with somebody uh, there as well. So program it into your phone. Uh, keep it handy in case you need it. 
If you have medications that are unused or expired, we'd encourage you to get rid of them. Uh, this is uh, a great way uh, during Poison Prevention Week to use this as a week to say every year at Poison Prevention Week, the third week of March, I'm going to go through my medicine cabinet and get rid of the stuff that's expired. Uh, do it during your city cleanup week. Pick, pick a time and go through that medicine cabinet. I guarantee you're uh, apt to have something that is probably expired. Um, we uh, also have uh, a lot of medication uh, take back sites in the state. If you go to the attorney general's website, uh, you will find uh, this is the list for the entire state. There are uh, drop off sites all over the state uh, in either law enforcement agencies or um, pharmacies where you can take the medication in in its original container you can leave the label on uh, and you simply put it in the boxes look like this it's like a little mailbox you open the door you drop the meds in and they will uh, take those medications to be uh, incinerated so consider doing that this is another way that you can dispose of it uh, these uh, this image here shows where you can take a Ziploc bag, uh, put the medication into it, add some water to dissolve it, and then uh, mix it with something that's not consumable, coffee grounds, kitty litter, sawdust, uh, sand, anything like that, and throw it. Or uh, through the state, you can get this Deterra bags that have an act, a deactivating uh, ingredient in them. If you simply call your local public health departments, um, they will have those available. What we don't want you to do is throw it uh, down the toilet. With that, um, these are some sources where you can get some more information. Uh, my email is safekids at altru.org. You can also go to our website, which is safekidsgf.com. I would love it if you would go to our website and along the right-hand side, uh, there's a link you can click on uh, to sign up for our newsletter. We send this out electronically uh, once a quarter, and it's filled with lots of uh, great information to help keep families safe. This is my personal contact information. And I just really want to thank the Foundation for Healthy North Dakota for the great work that they are doing uh, to keep our state uh, healthy and safe uh, and for having me here to present today. So with that, if there's any uh, questions, you can either email them to me, you can put them in the chat, and Mary, I'll check with you to see uh, if there is anything. Awesome. Yes, thank you. This was wonderful information. Uh just a good refresher. It's been a long time since I've seen a lot of these. There's a lot of new things. Some of those, the e-cigarette stuff, that is just crazy how that has just evolved. I did not realize that. Um, thank you so much. Uh, so I do have a, a, a QR code as we move into questions, if, if you are able to take that. I do see one question up here from Sherry. Yeah, somebody asked about if you could put carbon um, monoxide detectors near the floor. Uh, my colleague and uh, the coordinator for Safe Kids, Bismarck Manthan, did answer that, and she's exactly right. Carbon monoxide is the same whether it's high up in the air or down low. Smoke alarms has to be up because smoke rises. Carbon monoxide is the same whether it's up high in the room or down low, so you can use an outlet low to the ground. So that is exactly correct. Um, and then uh, I see Sherry also asked if there are any brochures to hand out at the WIC office. Absolutely, Sherry, I would love to know where you're from. Um, and uh, either I can get them to you or I have fabulous colleagues um, with Safe Cards Bismarck Mandan or Safe Kids Fargo Moorhead. So if one of those coalitions are closer to you, I would get you connect, connected with um, the partner um, agency there. And I know that they'll help you out. So. Wonderful. And I can connect everyone to um, after this webinar. Wonderful. If you have any other questions, you can just type them in the chat. Uh, if any of you are from a community where you are interested in doing a med take back event, uh, I would say there are some logistical things that need to happen with that. We just did one on Tuesday that was a drive up drop off. Even though there are lots of med drop boxes in our community, we did it as a way to raise awareness. We did radio interviews and TV and, and newsletter and, and newspaper and stuff like that. 
If you would like to do a community med take back event, please reach out to me or again, I'll get you connected with the other coordinators in the state for safe kids uh, because there are some logistical things. You, I, I as a nurse can't just set up a med take back. You have to have law enforcement there and there are some nuances like that, uh, but we would be happy to help uh, talk about how, um, how you could set up an event such as that. Oh, another question came in is how do we get our CEUs? So for this webinar, we don't, we aren't offering that, but it is something that we are going to be setting up. So in the near future, um, when you attend our webinars, we will be um, incorporating that into our education. So thank you for asking that question. Yeah, quick question. Um, Jolene, are you by chance a nurse? Yes. Okay. I can offer you CEUs. Um, email me. I'll put my email address in. I have authorization for um, for CEUs uh, for for this presentation for nursing. So uh, oh. email me and we'll connect and I'll help you to get CEUs. Oh, that's wonderful. Thank you, Karma. That is yep. wonderful. There's a short little survey you have to fill out and return to me, but I can email that to you if you email me. So if you're a nurse and you want one uh, free CEU for attending, uh, just email me. Um, you can either safekids at altru.org or uh, chansen at altru.org and uh, I'll get you set up. Awesome. You know, we can include that information in the, um, the follow-up to Karma that you do offer that. That's great. Okay, um, and for those of you that are putting this into the chat, I'm not going to necessarily have access to the chat. So if you could email me, it's safekids, S-A-F-E-K-I-D-S at alltrue.org. And Mary can include that in the email that goes out afterwards, uh, just so that I can email you the link and I don't get your email uh, down wrong. Sounds good. I'm just making some notes here. So uh, I Sherry, I see you with the Devil's Lake uh, WIC. Uh, that is in my service area. I would be happy to uh, get you brochures. Uh, if you could um, reach out to me or, or even give me a call when you're done with this, uh, I can direct you how we can get you and I can get those on a courier over to our Ultra Clinic uh, in Devil's Lake and you can pick them up there and we can uh, distribute. I've got uh, stuff on uh, the laundry pods, medication, carbon monoxide. I've got all these topics and handouts. I'd be happy to share them. All right. This was great. Thank you for the engagement from everyone. Um, and thank you, Karma for being here and presenting on such important topic um, on the hazards in the house and just protecting our children. It was just very informative. Um, to stay connected with the foundation, you can follow us at Healthy NODAC on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Foundation for Healthy North Dakota on LinkedIn. Um, also to join the coalition, you can visit the link to stay aware of future up, uh, webinars and updates on the foundation. And lastly, another chance to scan the QR code. It will also be emailed out um, along with the recording and a lot of the information uh, that Karma and I are talking about, um, how to get in touch with her, the resources and such will all be e emailed out after uh, the webinar is done. So thank you everyone and have a good rest of your day. <laughs>